notice that the Commission for Cult, uh, Institutional Change is not actually able to be here. We hope to have them at a later date, but I guess it, they figured out that trying to talk to us while being in a giant all-encompassing meeting was kind of a lot to do. So um, when they have recovered from that, we hope to have them and to, to learn about the meeting. Our own Asia Hauser being one of the people present at the meeting today. So we'll for sure hear about it from her. But today we're gonna to talk about the hearings around, uh, well, I don't know if you really can call them hearings, uh, around the debacle that we're having around uh, confirming uh, Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. So we have some folks who have been and one who's on the way back to Washington, DC. First though, let's have our regulars introduce themselves and Jessica describe our tech opportunities today. Yeah, I'll start us off. This is Jessica um, from Seattle, Washington. I am going to be on uh, Facebook Live here in the um, chat. I'm going to be on Twitter, hashtag The View. I'll be fielding your questions and comments um, back to our hosts and our wonderful guests. And I'm excited to be here. Uh, how about you, Michael? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you as usual from Peekskill, New York. It's uh, it's good to be with you. Christina, how are you? Hi, everyone. It's Christina Rivera. And today I'm actually joining you from Stanton, Virginia, uh, which is where I live. Um, and it is beautiful here today. So weather, but I, I'll take it. Well, let's start with Wendy Von Corder, who you can see maybe is on a train. <laughs> Wendy, tell us where you're going on the train. Oh yeah, there's the view out the window. And, um, and also what you did last week on the train. Sure. I actually plan on being on this train. I planned on being on a train last, last Thursday, Wednesday night to take the overnight train down to be part of the action on this Thursday. And um, then got on and then going back late that night. And then got on an organizing call last Wednesday night. And by the time it was over, before it was over, it was already throwing stuff into the car and I drove down. So last week I drove down through the night on Wednesday to participate in the actions that began on Thursday morning and ended up staying through um, three, there were three arrests in three days. I, I've sort of lost track of days. Um, I just know that it gets swept up in the urgency from the organizers and to know that they have been there, some of them since August, it was uh, compelling and uh, privilege to be part of that. And so sort of the same thing happened this week. I had not intended at all to go down. Um, ministry at home was, was calling in, in large and small ways. And so I thought, well, I'll just support it from afar and encourage other people to go. But once again, the, the call, um, I think the call from the organizers, especially the people that were working so hard and had been and were were asking specifically for clergy too. There were not an overwhelming number of clergy present. And that's something that I've, I've witnessed in the immigration justice circles and in all of the stuff we do. That's not in any way to diminish the many, many clergy who are showing up in those ways. But once again, there was a specific call for clergy, you know, and just the one who said, I need, we need that and pointing to the policies. And so, I would say that it's not just the, the call of my own soul to respond to this horrific, horrific sham. And it's not just the thought that my own grandbaby, you now eight, almost nine months old, my granddaughter will have stories of her own if we don't turn this around and stop this rape culture now. And even if we turn the tide now, she probably will have her own story, right? We all know that. But it was also these organizers. They're so committed. They're so. Wendy, who are teacher. these organizers you're talking about? Who, the who's two organizing? Groups that I've been working with is um, that I've responded to is it's the Women's March, but in collaboration with the Center for Popular Democracy. And there you have formed the, I don't know the whole story of how they came to be in such tight relationship, but what I've witnessed is, is the, two groups working hand in hand 
sometimes doing separate actions. For example, last week, the, the second arrest in front of the Supreme Court, that was a women's march action that they had chosen, but there were people from the Center for Popular Democracy also that were involved in that, and likewise the other. And so the group has been staying, I, I guess I don't want to name a lot of locations and whatnot, the group has been staying together in communication and, and really effective. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Katie, you were there last week. Were you also, did you feel called by those same organizers or what was your story for, for being there? So, um, Abhi Janamanchi. I'm uh, sorry, did I even introduce you all? I'm just really, I'm just really sorry. <laughs> that was Wendy Von Gorder from Marblehead, Massachusetts. Katie Romano Griffin, we're so glad you're here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I thank apologize. You. It's fine. I'm the assistant minister at Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation, and I'm in Bethesda, Maryland. So, I'm just a few miles from DC. Um, we have, you know, DC in some ways is a lot like Boston where there's a lot of Unitarian Universalist congregations in a concentrated area. And um, there's always so much happening in DC that we're in DC a lot. Sometimes I feel like I'm in DC as much as I'm in the congregation and social justice isn't even a primary part of my portfolio, but some things, the demand is so high, especially right now with this administration that we're there a lot. And we, uh, all the, I feel like the ministers in our UUMA chapter are all plugged into a variety of organizations. So my call actually came from our colleague Zebulon Green, who works with um, Wes, one of the, uh, at the ethical, Washington Ethical Society. And um, and I responded and connected with some of the groups that he was connecting with on Friday when I was down in DC, participated in the action and then provided pastoral care to survivors, both in the Hart Senate building and then um, just off the Supreme Court steps because um, people are, you know, feeling re-victimized and um, things are surfacing that maybe haven't surfaced in decades and the need for clergy. And like Wendy said, there wasn't a lot of clergy present and many of the clergy participated in civil disobedience. So folks that had been survivors that were released and then other survivors who didn't participate in civil disobedience were present with some of the actions. And there was a lot of resilience and a lot of energy, but also a lot of pain. And that's what I was present to, um, to help people with. Thank you. And Christina, you were also there last week, I know. Would, would you like to say something about your experience and your call? Because I, I'm thinking about Mark Morrison Reed's research about who went to Selma and why. What, what were the personal connections that got people where they went? And that feels so important to me. Um, so I love, Katie, your naming who called you and Wendy and it's so, um, but Christina? It, it is, I think that's one of the things that we forget how relational um, this work is and, and how important it is to foster that relationship, not just at the time of the call, but, you know, between. And that, that you know, as Mark said, you know, when he was at Selma, he was talking about, um, you know, just the different ways in which you can, it, it can make a difference between, you know, an email going out and there being a call for clergy and um, a clergy member call, colleague calling you and saying, we need you there. <clears throat> and just that call or text really does make a huge difference. Um, in my case, um, I am on the board of a, a direct action group here in Charlottesville called Congregate uh, Seville, which is made up of clergy. Um, and um, a couple of uh, the clergy members um, and organizers and supporters um, had been very active and had been in DC almost every day um, the, the past couple of weeks, um, you know, um, being arrested, um, being in the hallways, um, some of the, the 
AP images that we saw were of um, some of the people from Charlottesville actually traveling up and, and um, you know, just trying to disrupt uh, this was which was which is trying to be business as usual right um so it was being in in relation with them and um <laughs> it was so funny the week before every time my uh, my colleague called me and she was like okay can you go today i'm like oh my gosh i can't go today and so finally last thursday was was the first day that i was like yes i'm clearing everything and you know taking taking a day and going um and that also happened today to be the day that Wendy uh, was there and, and Katie and um, uh, Susan Frederick Ray um, had heard the call and had um, changed up her plans, her travel plans uh, to be able to be there with us. And Michael Crumpler was there. Um, and I think that that I don't think we can overstate the importance of clergy being there, uh, yeah. both from basically from both what Katie and Wendy are talking about. Um, both from the visual standpoint of clergy saying this is not okay and from what katie is talking the pastoral standpoint of being there being able to minister to people who desperately need it um who for you know lots of reasons this entire couple, past couple of weeks um, are a microcosm of the past couple of years um, of what people are experiencing as really um trauma-inducing and trauma-triggering, um, you know, in our countries in general. So I was, I was, um, I too was distressed that, that we didn't have as much clergy as I'd love to see. And I, I think that's, um, you know, somewhat on us to, to make those calls and, and say, hey, I'm going to be there or, hey, I'm not going to be there. Can you be there? Uh, because I can't be. So Wendy, there are some dramatic footage of your having your clerical collar removed uh, during your arrest. I, I'm curious, when you were arrested, you were arrested with a whole group of people and um, who were in the group with you and did you feel like it made a difference to do that? And Jessica has an image, she'll flash before us of, of um, the arrest, one of the arrests. Did you say you were arrested three times this week? Um, yes. It must have been Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or maybe there were, I think it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, so that, that picture, so this is, you know, I, I am, if nothing else, truthful to the core, so I'm going to actually tell you that this picture, and I've had this happen one other time, but a very dramatic picture that is going viral and it says so much was in some ways accidental. The young woman who was taking that collar on. And so I wanted to say a couple things about it. So first of all, in that group, you asked who was being arrested. This was the arrest when we were outside of the Supreme Court. I had not intended to. And Christina talked about relationships and stories and what made me agree to be arrested rather than as a supporter in that moment was that a young woman I was standing next to told me her story. And she wanted to get arrested, and she didn't realize that you needed cash for bail. And so I said, I'll pay your bail. I'll come in with you. And so this was not intended. We had been sitting in the rain for a long time. And then I walked over. I got taken over to this officer. And I remembered her from the day before. And she said, yeah, you're the minister with the killer legs. And so we actually shared this very humane moment. And I share that because there's a humanity in all these pieces. You know, this, this person had a role and, and we have a role. And so all of that plays out, but sometimes an image gets grabbed that speaks so, it, it's, it speaks to what's at the core. And there are people that are outraged seeing this and they wanted to know why is the collar being taken off? And I would say two things. One is that they've always taken my collar off except for one time and I think it was an accident that they didn't what they don't usually do. And sometimes I've had it thrown on the ground too. I've had my chalice uh, chain was intentionally broken in Arizona. This was routine. It's a piece of jewelry that's like a cuff right here that could be a weapon. What was different about this and unfortunate, 
in terms of the, the optic for them is that they did it in public. They searched us all there, and then they searched us again inside of the jail facility. And so the call didn't have to come off them. And I don't know if um, that there are people saying, you know, deep clergy, you know, but it, it happened. And I think one of the things that's on us as well, as Christina said, you know, we should be calling out the clergy in, is that we need to use the images, we need to use the stories, we need to all go back to our towns and get pictures out there. And it's, it's a really important thing. One of the things that I, I wanted to add too, and listening to the others who went, is that the, the power of hearing all the stories is another thing that keeps me connected to this. They're so horrific, and some of these women are sharing them for the very first time ever. And they're sharing them over and over and over again. And you can see the trauma, and you, you experience you know, this trauma in hearing the stories too and holding them. I think we as clergy often like I carried all the stories I've ever heard of women of all ages that I can't share. You know, they're shared in confidence and they're not willing to share. And then you, you get there and you hear every single day, and there'll be more stories shared today. Women are coming of all ages are drawn to this because that's what's at stake. Uh, I just read another one um, yesterday. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but Connie Chung just shared her horrific story um, and still with great fear about and, and vulnerability in doing that. I'm a little rambly because I'm a little tired, so I'm just going to be quiet and see if you have another question for me, Meg. I apologize. That's okay. I'm going to um, open it up to other people. I'm, I'm really glad that we got as much of you as we did, Wendy, because you just, as I said, never know on a train. So, um, so I'm, I mean, one question that I do have, because like probably all of you, we've all been hearing stories for the past couple of weeks. One of, um, one of the kinds of stories that I'm hearing is of, um, the ones I've heard have been from women. I know there are others too who have been violated in Unitarian Universalist spaces by Unitarian Universalists. In the cases I've heard men, I'm sure there are other violators too. Um, and, and one of my things is um, when we keep aligning ourselves and saying, oh, we're here for the survivors, but we don't confront the perpetrators who are amongst us, um, do we have any credibility? So one of my things is how, how do we actually meaningfully deal with the fact that, you know, these aren't other people somewhere else. The, many of these people are family members who are, who are still in our congregations. And, and I've got stories I can't tell that back that up from this last couple of weeks. But that is particularly one of my things for my, if there are cisgender men listening to this, uh, that I think it's partly, it's on you. It's on you to be hearing and listening to and supporting atonement and getting it right and restoration uh, by people who may be legitimately feeling guilty and ashamed of something they did a long time ago. Where are they going to go and find healing that includes justice so that we can be a community together? So that, that's my little soapbox and I'll step off of it. But I, I just, I'm, I'm disappointed that I'm not seeing more men particularly step up to that. I'm seeing men talk about their compassion for survivors and their work to embody their own, you know, softer selves. And that's all great. I, I like all that, but I really would like to see, um, I, I would like to see some um, more honesty about, you know, that I think of that Thich Nhat Hanh poem. Tell me about my true names. Wendy, are you trying to respond here? You're muted. Yeah, just because it was noisy here. But one of the things I wanted to flag to Meg is that, that one of the things that's coming up and up and up and that is, is a great story is all of it, is how the system worked to silence people. I mean, it's just whether it's a university saying, no, we're just going to keep this to ourselves, or a congregation it's or, or family. You know, so often families and neighborhoods and all of this. And so I'd also like to see men stepping up to be in that part of that not harder, but that difficult conversation to say, so, you know, we may be pleasant in that piece. And that's one of the pieces that's the hardest. There was just somebody to put up on a 
thing about what President Trump did to mom, her, and that noting that one of the things that, that Dr. Ford said was the most difficult was hearing the laughter. And he just created the laughter all over again. So there's this piece that, that you you know name about the, the actual assault and all of that. And that's really important. But there's this other piece, too, about how our entire systems, schools, families, have worked, our churches have worked to keep things quiet. We know that happens in Unitarian Universalism, right? Yeah, and I'll and I'll say that um, we do know that that happens in in UU spaces, and um, you know, I in the past year I've been through some things, um, you know, in UU spaces, and people are often surprised and, and express outrage that it happens in UU spaces, and I think one of the things we have to remember is that we are. Um, you know, just a reflection of what is going on in our wider communities. And we are gathered together in faith to try and change that, um, but to expect our, um, or assume that our UU spaces are somehow um, outside of that um, and, and not want to recognize the harm that is being done in UU spaces just because um, you know, the Unitarian Universalists and want to think that we're, we're outside of that um, is, is harm in itself. Um, and I, I will give a shout out for the UUA who has very intentionally over the past three years um, changed the process by which um, people can come forward with ministerial misconduct. Um, the process is much more um, focused, uh, I don't want to say victim focused, but much more um, supportive of people who are bringing forward um, misconduct uh, by by clergy. Um, we actually uh, went to a, um, a victims group, a victims rights group, and asked them to bring us through the process of reviewing everything. Um, about our process and the ways in which we were silencing people and the ways in which we were not giving um, enough support. Um, and that process has been majorly overhauled in a way that um, I found to be very um, honest about, about where we were lacking um, and where we were engaging in harm. Um, you know, as an institution. So I, I absolutely encourage people that, you know, if they, even if they want somebody to talk to about whether or not what they're experiencing you know, falls into, you know, ministerial misconduct, to please make use of the, those services because they're there for a reason. Um, and, you know, they, um, it, it, it seems to me that they're they're much more robust now uh, in ways and, and supportive in ways that they were not before. It's really great to hear. Katie, did you want to say something? Yes. So um, we know we have many congregations that are after pastor congregations. And um, I, I hope that the same folks who are enraged with what's happening in the Kavanaugh situation can look at their own rationalizations about the folks who have misconducted or other issues of power and control and misogyny that have risen up in, in congregations that happen in all communities, right? Because we're all swimming in the same soup. But the ways in which things come up, the person who was um, you know, assaulted at coffee hour by the other member and the split that happened in the congregation, I'm just sort of giving a composite here, right? Because this happens in lots and lots of communities. I'm not speaking to anyone indirectly, but these things happen where someone is, is groped at coffee hour and then they're suddenly whiny, making it up, um, being too sensitive. So how are we taking this rage at what's happening in DC right now and also turning the mirror on ourselves to explore our reactions to these things that happen in our communities, in our office environment, in our families, 
and doing some of the deeper work so that our justice work is in alignment with who we're seeking to be as human beings and our deeper values. You know, I found that there's something amazing that happens when people are willing to say, no, we're not gonna replicate the, the systems that we were taught to replicate. Um, I've dealt with misconduct allegations in my ministry, uh, not against me, but against others. And there's th this incredible pressure from so many sides from society. And, you know, people come up with the, the most amazing excuses why things need to get swept under the rug. Um, even if people are willing to say, okay, this person can't participate anymore, we're going to get rid of them, but we're still going to, we're going to sweep the whole thing under the rug so the whole community doesn't know why they disappeared. Um, and when enough people, especially in leadership, are willing to say, no, we're not doing that, there's like, you can almost hear the cracks in the system. Um, like <laughs> things start crumbling and cracking and, and new things emerge. Um, and, and it happened here that the board that I am blessed to work with, the leadership of the congregation I serve and, and the religious professionals here, we all just said, nope, we're not going to sweep this under the rug. And, you know, just like what's happening in D.C. now, the stories come forward. And it's not necessarily this happened here in this congregation, but, um, you know, when I came forward with what happened to me, this is not what happened. And the pain that, that comes forward around that. And um, it just pours out because all of a sudden you've cracked this, this wall that has been um, holding it back. And so I'm, I'm really glad to hear that there's pastoral care being provided to people who are, are at protests um, there because um, if we're successfully cracking the wall with Kavanaugh, um, things are going to flow flow forth um, that need to be held in a certain way. But I don't really have a question about that. Wendy? <laughs> so I, I want to also name that we have our own Anita Hills and we have our own Dr. Fords, and they've been slammed. And um, and they've paid enormous prices. And so we, we have to acknowledge that this isn't a matter of the leadership to say, well, we're going to do this now. That we have, you know, the smashing the patriarchy and bringing it down, we don't have to look too much further than our own. And I'm really encouraged to hear about different stories in the UA. And I hope that those same stories are emerging you and other collegial circles because in the same way that if this nomination goes to be you know more rules and and a lack of trust and, and hopefully this resistance won't slow down and we'll keep going. But we've had people try to call us into accountability. Um, and we we failed them. And so that lack of trust has been really well earned. And even when we look at what happened with the Berry Street Commission, you know, where I thought we were cracking through, and then suddenly there was this incredible resistance. So I just I just want to hold up that we have our, our own Anita Hills too, and Dr. Flores, who have come forward at great cost to themselves. And even when it felt like maybe they were fully supported. Katie, I liked what you said about channeling the rage, you know, channeling the rage about the Kavanaugh hearings to, in part, you were saying, look into our own institutions. How, how are you, how are, how's everyone channeling their rage? How's everyone doing with your rage right now? Sometimes I feel like I'm just channeling it into just an enormous primal scream, but I feel like other times, you know, I can get more focused about elections and particular, you know, people and stuff. But I'm curious, Katie, how you're seeing your congregation, because you are, you all who are in the D.C. area, and I know so many people at Cedar Lane are part of the government. Um, how's it going with the rage there, and, and how's that channeling? 
That's a good question. Um, it is, um, it's tough right now. Um, I'm also a survivor. So, you know, part of my work has been carving out space to be healthy and do the work, you know, and fortunately as ministers, we have great support networks. So that holds me while I'm holding the congregation, which does have a lot of a lot of feelings right now, lots of different types of feelings. One of the things we did on Sunday during our pastoral prayer is I put the feeling wheel as an insert into our order of celebration and we created prayer together. I invited people to shout out the feelings that they've been holding and maybe not able to voice or their voices have been silenced so much that maybe they couldn't name the feeling and and the feeling wheel was there to support that process so we shouted out our feelings together and wove it into a unified prayer um, and i'm also doing lots and lots of pastoral care this week um, with with some long hours and knitting people together who need to be in contact to support each other so um, it's channeling rage, but also creating the space for healing and where the holy is. And I will say one of the stories that I've shared with folks is a lot of our, our work here, we see clear partisan divides when we're doing social justice work. And what I'm witnessing is even, you know, the Poor People's Campaign, we saw a lot of people, you know, start to come together, more fusion politics. What I'm seeing with what's happening now is a grassroots coming together of people from across party lines to say that this isn't acceptable. And I think that that is that hope is something that's also touching people and sharing what it's like for our folks who are inside the government buildings while we are outside doing the work that they've called us to do to be able to bring these stories back is providing a release for the many things that folks are holding. That was a great sound shouting in the sanctuary with other people. I would have liked to have been there for that. Um, how, how about you, Michael? What did your congregation do on Sunday about this? I'm just curious how this is living uh, in our... Yeah, I mean, I uh, felt called to acknowledge the pain and the trauma that people were feeling and to acknowledge the rage. Um, part of sort of my calling as a cisgender male minister at this moment is um, to, to witness the feelings and to witness all, all of what people are, are dealing with, to be there for pastoral care, but in some ways, to step aside and let people voice it. Um, and just, I, I wish I had thought of what, what you did, <laughs> Katie. I love that idea that people just get to, to name the feelings. It, it, with your permission, I might, I might steal that. Um, but- uh, If it's with permission, it's not stealing. It's not stealing. I, just... <laughs> I, might, I might borrow it. And credit you. it, yeah. And credit it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just, you know, part of what I tried to do on Sunday was was just hold this container that that people, you know, and I, I guess it's not terribly different from what I do every Sunday, but it had a special urgency this week. Um, and I named very particularly the things that were happening that were bringing up uh, trauma and sadness and rage in so many people and um and i acknowledged that uh that rage needed to be channeled to burn down the things that needed to be burned down in our society to, to uh to to knock down the walls that needed to get knocked down because sometimes that's what it takes um but it's um you know it's it's hard for me because I, um, I want to give voice to people without being their voice, right? I want to I want to encourage people who are feeling this, um, and especially people who are not cisgendered men, uh, to use their voices to express the feelings 
that they're feeling. They shouldn't need me to speak for them. Like, you know, I, I don't need to mansplain traumatization to the congregation. And so it's, it's a tricky thing, right? I have to acknowledge it. I have to witness it. Um, and I hope I did that on Sunday. People seem to appreciate when I said it, but. Yeah. Wendy, how does your congregation uh, relate to you, to the minister going off and getting arrested and, and all of that? Do you feel support from them? Oh, total support. And, um, and also I think that, and I love the, the feeling we all do. So I would be with permission to use them. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think it also provides a way. I have a very supportive congregation. I've been there for, this is my 13th year. And they're, they're social activists to the core. And so that helps. And we've been having lots of different spaces where this, their stories are coming up too. But I think I would additionally say that my action, it allows them to have a action too. I went with prayers and blessings and stories, sacred stories that were shared to me in private messages. And so I think that's another way that there is a connection to what do we do? Well, our minister is going down there. And so I was aware of sort of the, the sacred weightiness and privilege of that too. Christina, what happened in your congregation? Um, so our lead minister scrapped um, what he was <laughs> gonna be doing on Sunday and um, you know completely changed, changed um, what was going to be happening. Uh, to acknowledge and hold, you know, the pain of uh, many survivors in the congregation and also had um, the sanctuary open last Thursday while the testimony was happening, while the hearings were opening um, as, a, as a safe space uh, for people to gather who, you know, wanted to acknowledge that that was happening but couldn't um, and in some cases shouldn't, um, you know, re re-traumatize themselves by, by listening to that. And so to be in a place um, where they could be spiritually fulfilled. Um, and the only other thing, you know, I would mention as the, you know, uh, non-ordained clergy here, uh, person here, is that um, I would really encourage, um, you know, my ordained colleagues to reach out to their religious professionals in their uh, congregations and you know talk about what it means for them to participate and to be to be felt to be called um because we often think a clergy call is just about um you know people who have rev in their name uh in their title and that's not uh, my understanding of it at least and so what does it mean to expand that world of of who we are reaching out to as colleagues and bringing them into it. Um, because I certainly, in my ministerial formation, would not be where I'm at without having had an ordained clergy member or two or three <laughs> along the way um, say, no, th th this is a call for you. Um, and, you know, have further conversations about what that meant and, and whether or not I was ready to accept that um, as a call. Um, but that's that's also something that, that we can do to, to broaden our, um, our support. Well, and you're a religious educator and part of the community of religious educators. And I, I am curious what you're seeing because those folks are immersed in these families, which is, let's be real, where a whole lot of the violence happens. It doesn't happen in the streets, uh, you know. I mean, yes, it does, but so much of it, what people are traumatized by now is from their families. And I'm curious what the family ministers are looking at. So, you know, as expected, there was a flurry this week or the past couple of weeks in our um, in our Facebook groups, um, calling for resources, people who had uh, led um, support for families, uh, support for their religious education programs, how to talk about the Kavanaugh hearings, you know, in uh, religious education classes that were, uh, that's age appropriate, um, you know, how to, you know, we're tremendously lucky that we have OWL as a resource um, in religious education, uh, both for adults and children to be able to touch back to that 
um, as a touching stone. Um, and then also, you know, the real nitty gritty of putting people, uh, putting families in touch with outside resources that they need, therapy resources, um, clergy resources in order to navigate. We saw a lot of families who were, this was the first time that they were really um, able to say, yes, we need to address what's gone on in our family and coming to religious educators and saying, you know, can you, can you help me do that? Um, because many times a religious educator um, can be a family's primary minister. And, um, and so we, you know, I, I've seen over the past couple of weeks, a lot of um, talk in our, in our uh, colleague circles about, um, you know, best practices and, and all of that type of thing. So, um, yeah, it's definitely out there. But I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what, what is the wisdom about talking to kids about the Kavanaugh hearings? I mean, there's so many aspects to it that are so offensive, right? And so, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like, so where would you even start wading right. through the lack of democracy, the lying, the, I mean, there's so many at the, this, you know, this is what we're all talking about, but this is a tiny bit of the problem right. with these hearings. So I'm really curious, <laughs> what so, do you say to young children? You know, I don't have one right now. Again, we, you know, we, it's age appropriate. So for our younger kids, we might talk about um, our principle of democracy and what that means and what that looks like in our congregations and what it looks like in our country and why um, it's important to, um, you know, tell the truth and um, have places where you can tell the truth. Um, as we get a little bit older and people want to know, you know, the, you really, you have to go based on what you're hearing from the kids because you don't want to like, you know, insert <laughs> into, into their lives things that haven't been there. So we've had, um, you know, some of our older elementary middle school kids who actually know what's going on, you know, actually sit and have conversations um, based on what they've heard in OWL about consent and what that means in, you know, in their lives. And, um, and so we're, we're maybe not talking about the specifics of the case, but we're talking about it in ways that um, are meaningful to their individual lives. And then at the high school level, I actually wrote a, um, a really brief um, study guide to go along with an article that came out um, about specifically about one small part of this, um, which was the yearbook um, that came out from Kavanaugh's class and how there was um, a woman um, that many of these um, young men called themselves Renata alumni. Um, and this was her name. And they, they, you know, immediately denied that it had to do with um, having a sexual encounter with this woman, um, but that they just had all dated her. And that somehow that thought that we could identify ourselves as just people who had dated her was okay. Um, and what that meant. And so kind of having a study guide around um, the, I can't tell you the questions so I read off the top of my head, but you know, what does it mean um, to have, um, a, you know, a, a, a dominant class of people, men, cisgender men, um, you know, be able to uh, label and um, say something about a, another person that is then um, so institutionalized that it comes out in your yearbook and what does how do you want to be represented how how that goes on you know for forever and um and and talking some about you know she had come out as a supporter of him and didn't know about um this had been in the yearbook and had been a thing and what that must have felt like and so you know kind of taking them through um just a really small um, portion of it so that it's not so huge, right? You're not talking about everything, um, but you're talking about something that they can relate to because they're in high school and they, you know, have yearbooks. And, um, 
So that's that's a little microcosm of, of the. <laughs> what you that's great. I love like that. Jessica, I'm so curious what your child has to say. Jessica has one of those kids who always says something. Who's 10? Is he 10? Yeah, he's 10. What's he got to say right now? Well, so, you know, I, I just wanted to give a shout out just when I was listening to Christina talk about all that to our DREs and to our religious educators, because these conversations are so much easier if, if we have been consistent in uh, making sure that our kids are in religious education and are, are having these conversations already. And like, so for Liam, who's, you know, been a great, you know, kid showing up for church and showing up for his RE classes and all that stuff. And, and this is a conversation that, so it's not new. I mean, it's not, um, it's something that's easy to just continue to say, remember, <laughs> we talk about, you know, these things, um, you know, the inherent worth and dignity of people. And um, one of the things that he and I continually talk about is to believe people, believe women, believe particularly women of color, girls of color is what I say to him as a, you know, a white male cis kid coming up in this world. Um, that it's on him to, to believe people and that that's something that he can offer and compassion and that that's, that's on him to offer to people. Um, I mean, and he's there for it because he's already had such a great education up to this point, like he gets it. So you don't have to, um, I think, you know, as it makes it easy on me as a parent to, say, remember what you have been talking about, what we've been talking about, you know, for a long time. So, um, yeah, I'm so grateful to our religious educators for helping me as a parent um, navigate this world right now um, and trying to explain that to kids. But I think um, for Liam in particular, and probably for a lot of our UU kids, um, there is a constant need to know that it's going to be okay. I think um, so much of the experience of kids right now is watching parents' anxiety. And I think that's a hard place um, for kids to be. And sometimes, and I think it's okay to be honest with kids, to, you know, that's developmentally appropriate um, about why. Why are you sad? today? Why is mom crying about something, you know, when she's looking at her phone or, you know, I mean, those moments and just to be as real and authentic with our kids as possible about um, it is going to be okay. We're all together in this and there are people who are doing good things to, um, you know, Wendy Von Quarter is going <laughs> on a train to protest and people are um, standing up and, and, um, I should say, um, you know, moving up and, and, and doing things. Um, but just to be honest with kids, because they know, they always know, um, and they can tell, even if they don't know the specifics, nor should they, they know when something's going on. I've been thinking about um, the OWL adult curriculum, particularly around consent, and, you know, watching the defensiveness of men on social media about how any man could just any, you know, um, that, that having real conversations, it's never too late, I think, to, for, for some men who didn't get owl training. Um, uh, well, actually, I think a lot, a lot of all gendered people don't really understand consent as well as we might. And so to really, um, use OWL as a community resource right now to invite in larger community conversations about what consent means. Um, it seems like one, one offering that we really have that some other places don't. I haven't heard of anyone doing that, but I'm sure it's happening. I have no doubt in the world. Yeah, we are um, doing OWL for children and youth as a community thing, uh, outreach, uh, mechanism now not necessarily for adults and i like that idea and might might borrow that one too um you know and i'll bookend what you said meg it's never too late 
to talk about consent. It's also never too early to talk about consent. Um, I'm raising my my kid is five, and as of now, she's uh, she's still okay being identified as a girl. So um, you know, I'm raising a daughter in uh, in this society, and I've been talking about consent with her since she could understand concepts right and and again and again uh reminding her that nobody gets to touch her unless she says it's okay not even me um and uh you know it's never too early to talk about consent and i will say that one of the things that i'm struggling with now um this week is uh realizing that uh, I've spent so much time teaching my child that it's never okay to hit someone or kick them, or um, it's never okay to use violence against someone. And I'm realizing that I have to, I have to find a way to build an exception into that. And that scares the bejesus out of me. I, I don't know, like, how do you say, except in this particular situation, um, because there might be a situation in your life where you need to punch the daylights out of someone. Um, and I don't want to think that that might happen to my child, but I really don't even know how to begin that conversation with her. And it's made me um, really upset thinking about that this week. Christina, it looked like you were about to come in a minute ago. Um yeah, I, I think, and thank you, Michael, for lifting that up because it is super, super important because, um, you know, women are acculturated to, to not do that, um, to, you know, um, you know, not um, make a fuss, not be, um, I think as somebody said before, you know, be the, be the, you're either the bitch or that you're too sensitive, like, you know, <laughs> um, so Thank you for lifting that up. Um, the only other thing I would bring into the conversation is, um, you know, we, we, I'm thrilled for the level of participation that we're seeing, um, you know, in, in protesting and continuing to disrupt um, this, this process that is being couched as business as usual. And, you know, here's hoping he's not confirmed. Um, but I have to say in, in women of color communities, you know, one of our, one of our concerns is whether or not the next, when the next nominee is just racist and not sexist or not, you know, covert, overtly, um, whether or not there will be this same outcry and same support and same, um, same, level of disruption. Um, and I, I hope so. It's kind of the sign that you said that, that a lot of people saw at the women's march, the very first women's march, there were two black women who were holding a sign that said, um, we'll see you at the next Black Lives Matter rally, right? Um, and I'm really, really hoping um, that folks who are getting their first entree into this kind of social activism, understand the intersectionality of what's going on um, today. And we'll keep that in mind um, when that support is needed elsewhere. Well, and, and with that, I wanna promote this thing I just saw this morning on Facebook from Leslie Mack, Black Fridays, where women's very intersectional movement um, to every Friday, wear black and disrupt business as usual in every way that you can wherever you are and there will be organized things and, and it'll be uh, an ad hoc movement. And I, you know, it felt great to say <laughs> I'm there because, you know, it's, and it's through uh, Thanksgiving for now, you know, so it's regardless of confirmation of this particular person or not, you know, they're all going to be cut from the same piece of cloth. Uh, so um, yeah, I was excited to see that movement because Let's just say when Leslie Mack's involved, there's always something going on. <laughs> so, so I'm very curious to see um, what will develop out of that and to be part of it. And, and it asked for um, you to, when you signed up to offer skills that you had. And I said, I, with a little trepidation, but I said, you know, I'd like to help channel rituals of rage and grief on Fridays, you know, and, and Katie, when I hear what you did, I think, yes, that 
we do need places to really channel that, um, that, that bring healing in along with the rage because we can just stew in it in a way that actually reinforces helplessness. And um, we need it. We need to channel it to, to move forward. Other, I mean, I think this is, this is supposed to take us out. This is designed to take us out. So let it take us in, you know, so, so that Black Friday I'm excited about. Any final thoughts from any of our guests? We're coming to the top of the hour. Katie, you've, you've, you've been so wise. Got any more wisdom before we have to go? Uh, you know, just be, take care of yourselves. We all need to take care of ourselves right now and have our support networks and also be ready to support others. But we can't do that work unless we care for ourselves. We won't be as creative um, and then we won't be as useful to ourselves or others. And Christina, you're kind of a guest host this time because you were in DC last week. So I'm gonna throw it to you too. Um, keep showing up, keep disrupting, um, you know, look for it at the local level because we, we all are fortunate that we're close enough to, you know, come out to DC, but there is lots of things going on at the local level that just require um, you doing a little bit of research or starting your own. And finally, it looks like Wendy is off of the train and into Union Station or something. You got any parting words for us, oh traveler? Thank you, and please um, carry us with you today. Uh, next week, we'll be, what you got there? What's that button? Resist. Um, next week, we'll be sharing coming out stories. So um, if you've got one, we'd like to know it. So it's uh, coming out week. So uh, yeah, we'll be excited to have you there then. Thanks for coming, and see you later. Thank you.